the way to win is to not buy the luxury property, but instead create a property in a luxury market that is more valuable in comparison to a luxury market. So if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. It's on this podcast that we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. Well, today I've got a very, very special guest that is actually successfully directed over $70 million into strong cash flowing Airbnbs across the country. He is an Airbnb expert, AKA nerd. He knows the data. He knows the numbers. He knows how to slice it and dice it a thousand different ways to find out if the property will be a successful Airbnb or not. Well, listen to his success rate. My guest has got a 100% success rate across 150 properties for helping his clients acquire cash flowing Airbnb. So what are you going to learn in this podcast and why stay all the way to the end? Well, in this show, you're going to learn how to find a property that can be a profitable Airbnb because most properties are not. But my guest today is going to show you exactly how to do it in just a moment. You're going to meet my special guest, Mr. John Bianchi, right after this. Well, hello there, John. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay, for having me. I appreciate it. Great intro. Absolutely. 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 Well, uh, it's been quite a while since I had anyone here on the show that was specifically niched in Airbnbs. Perhaps I should have had you on the show before now, because right now I'm almost at the very end of converting my grandparents' old farmhouse built in 1928 into an Airbnb. So time will tell as to whether I should have done that or not. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I'm so excited to have you here on the show. What do you think about the idea of people using private money to uh, purchase Airbnbs? I actually have a lot of clients that have done exactly that. So they, you know, depending on how they got the private money, maybe it's their their rich uncle or their brother or their sister or somebody that they know from work. Um, I actually have quite a few clients who are raising money because they understand how to manage an Airbnb, but they just don't have the money for it. And so then they raise the money. They then hire me to find the properties and then, they get a good property, they get it set up well, and they manage it well. So I, I'm a huge fan of it if they understand the data before they do it and don't lose their uh, their client's money or their friend's money or their parent's money, right? So that's my opinion. Right. On that. How important is it um, if someone uses private money, based on what you've observed, uses private money in the short term to acquire the property, close quickly, use private money to uh, renovate the property. But then is it a good idea? Of course, I don't know in today's market with interest rates and institutional rates, but then refinancing, uh, is that a good idea these days in, in today's market? Or does it just depend on how good the numbers are overall? Honestly, I don't, <clears throat> I haven't seen many good deals that worked out that way uh, as of today. And like the I'm not saying that they don't exist. What I'm trying to say is that what I focus on are properties that are not needing a ton of repair. And so then therefore they're not going to have a very high after repair value. And so there's a bit of a difference with the type of properties that I hyper focus in on. Um, I mean, it definitely can happen. You just really have to know your numbers to make sure you get it right. Sure. Now, are you servicing, uh, of course you're up in Canada. Yeah. Uh, are you servicing clients primarily in Canada or across the U S or where? all across the U S oh, it, it doesn't work in Canada and almost nobody in Canada is investing over in the United States. I'm sure there is a handful of people that definitely are doing it, but, uh, I service almost hundred percent Americans. Gotcha. And yeah. your client, so describe your ideal client. What does your ideal client look like? 
it's somebody who is a high W two earner who is you know does not have a lot of time but wants to take, wants to take advantage of the STR tax loophole um, to be able to save on their active income taxes and so they need help identifying a property that they can purchase which they're going to feel confident is actually going to cash flow for them because as you mentioned at the very beginning of the show not every single property can cash flow i have a saying which is you know every property can be pretty right you can design it beautifully but not every single property can cash flow so almost all of our clients that are hiring us are usually high w2 earners or once again somebody raising money from a rich uncle and and trying to scale their own portfolio now you just said a phrase that I want to make sure our audience understands what you just said. And what you just said was the S T R tax benefits. Mm -hmm. What does S T R stand for? You and I know, but let's make sure the audience knows what S T R stands about. <laughs> I appreciate you catching that short term rental. So another word, like it, it is Airbnb and S T R are the same thing. It is a short term rental. So, um, Airbnb, of course, is, is, is a marketing, uh, trademark. Um, are, are you open? Do you also recommend using other marketing platforms such as VRBO and some of the others? Yeah. In some markets you need to be on both. So what I like to call traditional vacation rental markets, such as like your Gatlinburgs, um, those areas have always traditionally been on VRBO and they have slowly transitioned over to Airbnb. Uh, now if you're in the middle of the city, no one's ever been on VRBO in the middle of the city. And so it's not really the site that people use to find an Airbnb in the middle of the city. And so that's where Airbnb is going to dominate. Um, so it really does just, just depends on the market that you're in. And then if you're over in Europe, you know, you're probably going to be on booking.com and, uh, Expedia and different sites like that on top of Airbnb and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's just market dependent, I would say. Sure. Uh, do people use uh, Zillow for short-term rentals or not really? No, they do not. No. Like to sell them or buy them, are you referring to? No, no, no. To, to market your property to short-term gotcha. renters. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't Very think I've ever seen that. Yeah. So the main platforms are which ones? Airbnb. Airbnb and VRBO are the main ones for the US. I would say that if you, you know, just get on Airbnb. You're pretty well going to be good in 99% of the places across America. Perfect. Now you mentioned STR short-term rental tax benefits. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the high W2 earner that really wants to take advantage of that. What are the ta tax benefits that a short-term rental has a short-term rental property has that say long-term rentals don't? So I am not an expert at this whatsoever, right? So I'm going to state that right off the bat, um, but I will do my best to try to explain it. The When you own a short-term rental, uh, a Airbnb, you are able to take advantage of what's referred to as the STR tax loophole. I strongly recommend, you know, either looking up articles or YouTube videos that specifically talk about that. Um, if you meet certain requirements, you are able to write off your active income. And from my understanding, it's one of the few ways that you can write off your active income, right? And so people who are doctors or engineers or just some sort of high W2 earner that has to pay, you know, 50,000 plus in taxes every single year, they can actually purchase a short-term rental. And then if, once again, if they meet certain requirements, they can then qualify for the short-term rental tax loophole and be able to write off those taxes. And so, yeah, that's it. So the bottom line is ask your CPA, yes. what is the STR short-term rental um, loophole to where you can write off your own taxes is what it sounds like you were saying. Yeah, exactly. And I would actually not reach out to your own CPA. You might want to, because maybe you got the relationship there, but this is one of these scenarios where not every accountant understands it extremely well. Um, there's one firm called Hall CPA, which is like the go-to for this. They, un they understand it inside and out, and they really make sure that you qualify for it and are not uh, doing anything illegal. Interesting. Well, mm -hmm. I must say, I never heard of it. So if I haven't heard of it, that means my CPA probably hasn't heard of it. Because I've had some short-term rentals, not a lot of them. I've had three 
short-term rentals in the uh, in the past. So um, I'm very interested in in digging into that uh, myself. So on a thirty thousand foot view, no, mm -hmm. just to make sure I can understand it, make it a fifty thousand foot view. Okay. So on a, on a fit, so you're a data guy, right? Yep. You love yep. numbers. You love analyzing data. Um, so on that 50,000 foot view, what are some of the key criterias that you analyze when you're analyzing a property and it comes back and says, yes, this property should cash flow or nope, this property is not going to cash flow. And you probably got some long, very sophisticated formula that <laughs> you put all that data in and then it spits out a green go light or a red stop light or a yellow light that says caution, you need to sort of check this thing out some more, but what are the, what are the key areas that you analyze? Great question. I love the way you phrase that. Um, one thing I'm going to state right off the bat is that I'm actually not a trained data analyst. So I didn't go to school for it. I don't have a formal background in it. Nothing. Um, I just had to figure out how to make sense of the data that was out there because I actually had raised money to start up a rental arbitrage Airbnb business about six or seven years ago now. And so during that time period of, you know, feeling the pressure, I came up with a little bit of a process and that process has worked really well. Uh, I'm going to explain two things. One is going to be the, what I refer to as a 20% rule, which is pretty straightforward. And then two is just the simple way to actually understand if a property meets the 20% rule. So when I'm going to look for a property, I want to feel confident that it can meet what I refer to as the 20% rule, the price to rent ratio. So if I'm buying a home for $500,000, I want the revenue to be at least $100,000. If I can make that happen, or if I can feel confident that that $500,000 can actually generate a $100,000 in annual revenue, then that property is going to cash flow at an amount that I'm going to be satisfied with in most markets. And so that's my main metric, right? Now, the hard part is knowing how much that $500,000 property is actually going to generate before you buy it, right? So the way that you figure that out, and I've been trying to explain this in the simplest possible format for years now, and this is what I've come up with, okay? You ever heard, you ever see those, that game that you played as a kid where you had two identical photos? And the idea was to spot the difference between the two photos. And, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it, was, it was a giraffe and the giraffe's tail went one way and then the other way, right? That was the whole difference. Um, it was one of my favorite games as a little kid, right? Uh, and what I realized recently is that what I'm doing as a data analyst is I am looking at all of the, let's say, four bedrooms within one specific market, within one specific area. And there's going to be a revenue difference between all of these. Some are making you know, 150,000 and some are making 100,000 and some are making 80,000. And all I'm doing is trying to spot the difference between the property making 150,000 and the property making 80,000. And it's like playing that game where you, you're quite literally going back and forth between the photos and saying, why would this one make 150 and this one make 80, right? Because that's, that's how big of a variance there definitely can be between the exact same property in the exact same area. And so what I've been trying to explain to people is that the top performing properties have things that the underperforming properties do not have. And if you can spot the difference, if you can just understand what these ones have that these ones don't have, you will understand what the revenue drivers are for that market. And so then once you understand what the revenue drivers are, you can then understand if the property that you're looking at to purchase has those revenue drivers. And if it does, then you can feel confident that it could potentially make the 150,000. And if it doesn't, then you might be lower, lowering yourself to the $100,000 category. And that's just how you would go through that. You would just repeat that process over and over and over again until you felt abundantly confident that the property you're about to purchase was going to meet the 20% rule. So when you are doing this comparison to come up with a answer as to whether the subject property should be a go or not a go. How do you know what the other properties are making? How do you so know there, their revenue? So there is a website out there that's uh, existed for about eight years now, and it's called air DNA mm -hmm. and it's air .co. That website records the calendar of every single Airbnb 
that exists across America. Actually, the entire world. Sorry, across the entire world. And what it's doing is it's trying to predict how much that property is making based off of the bookings that it's seeing come through on the calendar. Mm-hmm. And so the algorithm is just recording every single Airbnb, recording the calendar. What's the nightly rate? Did it get blocked? Did it get blocked? And then eventually it comes up with this annual revenue number. And then AirDNA has taken all that information and pulled it together in a nice format, which is very easy to read and to go through. Um, there's about four other websites, maybe even six at this point. But uh, really, there's only like AirDNA is the one I've been using for seven years. And and I find it to be the most useful and easiest to navigate out of all of them. Okay. So you're using air DNA, um, using that software to, to give you the, the revenue of the other properties. So back to the comparison of, of properties, um, in your experience, what are some of the main revenue drivers that you can have two comparable properties? One's bringing in 80,000, one's bringing in 150,000, What's that $150,000 property got to offer um, that the $80,000 a year property doesn't? So every single market's going to be different. So every single time you go into a market, you got to figure out what are the revenue drivers for that specific market. But just some general examples here is it usually comes down to the property being bigger, better, or more luxurious and having something that the other one just straight up does not have. So, uh, you know, with a big $70,000 difference like that, <clears throat> what you might find is that the property would have the one making 150,000 would have a pool, a large backyard with maybe a pickleball court in it, and maybe a putting green in it. And it's got, you know, two extra living rooms inside and, and you know, one's filled with a game room. The other one's filled with a movie theater. And it's really just offering a wide variety of additional amenities that are going to make the place worth a lot more money. And then the home doing 80,000, you know, likely has none of that. And maybe it wasn't marketed as well. In other words, the photos are not taken nearly as well and it's not showing nearly as desirable in comparison to the other one. And so those are can be those can be some very clear reasons as to why one property would be making more than the other property. That makes sense. And one thing that I have done in my real estate investing business for years is when I have a property that we have renovated and I mean, it's absolutely drop dead gorgeous, ready for Southern living magazine pictures. And we stage them to the hilt. I mean, we stage them to the hilt. Well, what I've done for years, in addition to having an excellent professional photographer with the pictures, but we also, by that same company, we create a music video of, Mm -hmm. uh, of touring the outside. We got drone footage. Uh, we've got walking through the entire, uh, the entire inside of the home and this, you know, fantastic music is pumping and playing in the background. You're seeing all the staging. Uh, how do you, how important do you think that might be? So the, the websites, um, VRBO and Airbnb, they actually don't allow videos. Mm. Uh, yeah. So we have not been able to do that. And so all we have are the photos that we take. And then therefore the photos that we take are extraordinarily important to get done well. So if they did allow it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, if it did allow it, it would, it would change things. I would say, I would say there'd be like, uh, uh, tons of those videos all over the place and trying to really show them off. And I guarantee people from LA and New York would try to make the most amazing, beautiful videos so that you would be dying to go to this place. Right. But they just don't allow it for whatever reason. Do they allow a link in the listing that takes you off of their site that you can go see the video elsewhere? They do not. However, Mm. what some people have done is they'll put up a photo and in the photo, they'll have a link in there. So it's not one you can click, but if you go and type it in, then, then you can actually see the video. However, it hasn't made a huge difference for the amount of revenue that you end up making, or if you win a Mm -hmm. booking over somebody else. So it's just not the it's not worth the squeeze, you know? Sure. Sure. Um, so when it comes to taking, uh, professional pictures of the property, does your company oversee that for your client? Yeah, we're, we're, I'm pretty crazy about that. (laughs) To be honest, that's like, that's the area where, uh, you have to get it right. And if the, 
if the photographer does a job that's like 80% good, we'll send them back out there to do it all over again. And we'll pay the person again to do it in case they uh, just miss the photos. But really what you're trying to do is create these photos that when somebody is looking at it, they feel emotionally attached to it. It, and, and it shows off your fire pit in this way that they can see themselves sitting there, right? You're not just taking a photo from a distance. And when you take a photo of the hot tub, they can they can feel themselves in there with a drink and with their friends and hanging out. And maybe you get models in the in the photos to actually show off what it's like. The way I always like to explain it is that you want it to feel like it's straight out of a magazine. Because if it's because when people look at those photos in magazines, they are in love with it. It's just like pulling them in for whatever reason, right? So if you can recreate that you're, you're going to create some magic and people are really going to want your property. What are some of the common repeating, repeating, repeating again and again, mistakes that investors make when they're investing in an Airbnb and they just don't know what they're doing? The, the, the main mistake that I see, and I think it's the biggest mistake. So there's a ton of little mistakes, but the biggest one is they buy the wrong property. And it's actually the main thing that I've been trying to build my business around. Like if you go and look at my website, it, right at the very beginning, it says trying to ensure that nobody buys an unprofitable Airbnb again. The uh, the amount of people that I've spoken with who have bought a property that will never cash flow breaks my heart. It is so upsetting because they, if they had just done a little bit of extra work, if they had just followed the process that I give away for free, they would have been able to figure it out. But they buy a property overpriced in a market that does not have enough demand to offset their expenses and they end up losing money. And the worst part about it is that everybody who buys one of those, uh, they don't realize that they're losing money until the full year has gone by. Cause they may think like, Oh, we'll make it up in the slow, or we'll make it up in high season. Right. And then they, they end up not, or they go, they give another excuse and they go, well, you know, year one wasn't that great. We were just getting ramped up and maybe we need to add some more amenities. And so then they go throw more money at the property and they run it for a whole other year. They make absolutely no money for the next year. And then they end up selling the property after two years, making no money. And in fact, losing money and working for free for two years. And so that is hands down the biggest mistake that you see in the Airbnb industry. And quite frankly, why there's so many people that have negative things to say about the Airbnb industry um, once they've tried it once or twice. You mentioned your website. Uh, let's go ahead and give out your website uh, to our audience. And your website is www.str, which stands for short-term rental, <laughs> www.strsearch.com, strsearch.com. So when someone goes to that website, what are the benefits of going to the website? The main thing that I've been trying to do again is to ensure that nobody buys an unprofitable Airbnb and to be able to do that, I can't gatekeep my process. That's how, that's how I logically think about it. And so I have created six free Airbnb data courses. So if you go to that website, you go to the top right corner, it's going to say free courses. You can click that. And uh, five of those courses are about anywhere from two hours to three hours long. And there's one course called the Bianchi method which is a 40 hour long course teaching every single step of the process that I used to be able to identify the 150 plus properties that are all cash flow positive over the past two years. And so what I'm really trying to do is build trust within the community so that people have a reliable resource and a reliable process that they can use to be able to find profitable properties. Um, and if they want to hire us because they don't want to do the work or they don't have the time, they have that option. So let's talk about that process or the service that you and your team offer to your clients. So from start to finish, you know, let's say that I, I contact you and I'm interested in your services. What does that list of services look like? So the main service that we have is what we refer to as the property finder service. Uh, you hire us to be able to identify which property you should purchase. And uh, it's it's quite literally that simple. So if you have over $150,000 of cash ready to go towards the closing costs, the down payment, the furniture and the renovation, then we're going to be able to help identify a property for you that we believe is going to be a strong cash flowing property and also just be a good real estate purchase. Right. So that's the end goal. Um, you're also going to get connected with all of our preferred vendors, whether it be a realtor that we work have been working with for a while, a lender that we've been working with the designers or whatever else it is that you're going to need to be able to bring that property to life, right? Now, the actual process of how we identify the property 
to determine which property you should get is based off of all the research that we've done over the past two years. So I've researched over 300 plus markets and I've identified it, identified a handful of those markets that I believe to be the best cash flowing markets across America. And it's my job to ensure that you get a cash flowing property. So then therefore, the more cash flow potential that you can get from a property, the more likely you are to be able to make it work, even if you screw up, right? So if you were to come to me and say, hey, I want to buy a property in Boise, Idaho, I would say, hey, sorry, that's not going to work. Uh, I don't believe that there's strong cash flowing properties in Boise, Idaho. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you to buy a property in Boise. And so instead, if you come to me and you said, Hey, I'm open to go, you know, into any of the markets that you've identified across America that you think are going to be best for me based on my budget. Can you help me find a property? That's where we're going to be able to come into play and help you identify that property. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. What is a, um, what's a good, good rule of thumb. If there is a rule of thumb for, of course, it's going to depend on the square footage, number of beds, number of baths, but do you have like a formula? Uh, or an estimator as to how much you should plan on budgeting to furnish your Airbnb? I don't. I don't have a great number. Uh, as you said, it does matter. It does vary. Uh, then on top of that, it really depends on the amenities. Uh, that's going to be, you know, are you going to be putting a pickleball court in? Are you putting an above ground pool? All of these things are going to greatly change the amount. Um, I think a rule of thumb that I've heard quite a bit is that if you're going to budget for what it's going to cost you, budget anywhere from, I think it's 3000 to 5000 per room. So if you have a five bedroom home, it's going to cost you 15000 No, I'm getting that number wrong. Yep. Uh, 25000 Yes. Well, exactly. if it's 3000 and it's a five bedroom, it's going to be 15000 Correct. Yes. <laughs> should depends be better. Using the, quick should be, it depends on if you're using the $3,000 number or the $5,000 number. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. And then, so that would be just the furniture on the inside. And this is what, I think this is where I, I'm, I'm different from most people um, is that I'm really trying to ensure that my people are getting properties that are going to be in the top 10 percentile of that market. And the main reason is because I want to ensure that they can make it through the next recession that is coming. So, I used to be in a financial advisor before, and as a financial advisor, you, you study all of the different times that the market has dropped, right? When the market drops, it takes anywhere from a year to two years to pick back up. And when it does pick back up, it's amazing, right? Everything goes well. It's the best time for the economy. However, if you can't make it through that two year period, right? Let's call it one year, or even two years, uh, you're going to be forced to sell that property. And it's going to be the worst case scenario. And I tr strongly believe that when we hit our next recession, there are going to be people losing their shirts on their Airbnbs because they're not going to be able to cover the bills and not going to get people in there to rent them out long-term. And so then therefore, when you're buying an Airbnb, you should really be buying it, trying to protect the worst possible scenario. And that worst possible scenario is when we hit the recession. And my theory on how to avoid that is that you pick a market that still has strong demand, right? Um, that's going to have travel, even if the economy goes down and you become one of the best properties within that market. And by being one of the best properties, when somebody does go to book, even if there was, you know, a thousand people traveling there before, and now there's only a hundred people traveling there, your property is one of those 100 properties that will still end up getting booked by the people still traveling. And if you can always focus on that, it's going to allow you to hopefully make it through the next recession. And so the reason I say this is because you're asking about the budget of, you know, how much does it cost to be able to furnish? And in reality, the reason why we tell people, you know, if you don't have less than $150,000, we don't work with you. It's because I strongly believe that you need more than $150,000 to put towards the amenities and proper design to actually be within that top 10 percentile so that you can make it through the recession, so that you can make it to the boom of when everything goes really well and you're not losing your shirt during that time period. And if you look at the, um, there's an indicator by... Uh, what's his name? The, the really, really amazing investor is, um, who's the best investor out there? What's his, he's like 90 at this point. I, and I always slip on his name. Oh, uh, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett has created a metric where it's an indicator between how much the stock market has raised and how much the economy has raised. And if you actually look at that indicator right now, it is twice as high above the, how much the market has raised in comparison to 2008. So before the 2008 crash, uh, the, the the stock market was double what the economy had raised. Now it is quite literally double that. Um, and so I 
can't imagine that we're not going to run into a recession in a very short period of time. And I'm very nervous for my clients because my entire reputation is ensuring that these people have positive cash flowing properties and I want to keep my 100% success rate. So anyways, that was a long rant, but um, it all ties into this idea of budget and how to succeed, right? Absolutely. Would you go um, for your Airbnbs? Would you go more upscale or smaller? I or prefer the market. I actually prefer to, it does definitely depends on the market because uh, there's some markets where you do have to go upscale, but I actually think the, um, the way to win is to not buy the luxury property, but instead create a property in a luxury market that is more valuable in comparison to a luxury market. So as an example here, Scottsdale is a market that has a ridiculous amount of luxury properties, right? And there's a bunch of them that are on Airbnb. And if you go and actually look at these properties, they're fairly boring. They may have a tennis court in the backyard and a beautiful pool and, and, you know, a really nice kitchen. Um, that is nice. However, it's not as much fun and it's not as exciting and it's also not hyper-focused on a specific demographic. And so what I actually prefer to do are, is to find properties that are considered to be, um, regular boring properties and then making them really exciting, depending on the demographic that you're trying to focus on. So if you mm. are going to be focusing on a, uh, you know, families for that market, Try to figure out every single, you know, amenity that you could possibly add to that property that's going to make it extraordinarily fun for the kids and go mm. above and beyond just the game room. But if you do do a game room, make sure that the colors that you use are very bright and fun and colorful colors that kids are excited about, right? Don't make it a, a adult one unless you are trying to focus on adults, right? And so I... Don't and I I don't advise my people my clients to buy luxury properties and we we haven't um, and so then therefore we've made it work by buying what I would refer to as these average properties. Okay. Yeah. We I have one I, of the. I think I understood the, that. I think I understood the answer. Yo, you said don't okay. you said don't lean towards luxury properties. Lean towards boring properties that can become exciting. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Sometimes I go a little too deep, <laughs> but, uh, one of the, one of my favorite examples is that in, uh, in a market that we're in, somebody bought a $2 million property and they're making over 200,000 with that property. We bought a $1 million property and we are making over $200,000 with that property. And so we've literally been able to match their revenue with half the purchase price. Mm -hmm. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well, what an interview here, John. Um, one more time, let's give out your contact information, www.strsearch.com, standing for short-term rental search.com, strsearch.com. Final and parting words there, John, for the audience. Um, all I want to say, guys, is, again, it, I'm trying to ensure nobody buys an unprofitable property. I've got six free courses, one of them being 40 hours long. I promise you, if you follow the process, you'll figure out the secrets. It takes a lot of work but it ensures that you don't buy an unprofitable property. And my track record proves that because we haven't missed yet, right? So strongly recommend that you go through that course if you're considering to purchase a short-term rental. And if you don't want to do all the work, we have the option that we can do it for you. Simple as that. Thank you awesome. again, Jay, for having me. I appreciate it big time. This was, this was great. I loved your questions. You, you got, got me. It. You got me all passion, passionate. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of energy going now. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. John, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And there you have it, my friend, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jayconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.